this webinar will be providing you providing you with an introduction a brief history development and overview of ip rights particularly in uh, copyright in teaching and research i think which is a pertinent topic for all the researchers and educators who are present right at this moment in the webinar uh, for me uh, it's personally indeed an honor that i will be sharing the screen with the respected speakers now before i call upon uh, dr nashima munshi our iqac coordinator and dr rp chakraborty our beloved principal sir who will actually uh, welcome formally welcome our participants and the speakers i would like to thank all attendees and participants for their overwhelming response to attend this web lecture uh now before we start with uh, i would like to request all participants to kindly mute yourselves and keep your videos off throughout the session however you can engage with us uh, through the chat box you can post your questions comments and suggestions in the chat box your questions will be placed to the speakers after their talk is over uh, in the question answer session and uh, the session will be conducted by my colleague ms subonika ganguli uh moreover your comments and uh, suggestions will also be highly appreciated by us now not wasting much time i would just like to request dr nashima munshi our iqac coordinator kk das college to address the participants dr munshi please if you can start thank you madhurima so a very good evening to our honorable resource persons respected principals sir distinguished participants present here and to all my dear colleagues i dr nasima munshi welcome you all on behalf of internal quality assurance cell kk dash college to this webinar on intellectual property rights jointly organized by central library department of economics department of commerce department of mathematics and internal quality assurance cell kk dash college kolkata we are happy to announce that nearly 140 participants all over the country have been registered to participate in this webinar and also we get two participants from other countries our participants list is a mixture of academicians as well as persons from other fields now i would like to extend special thanks to our today's speaker madam paramita dashgupta and dr anirban mojumdar for accepting our invitation and manage time for us in spite of their busy schedule i also would like to thank mr pritam kumar pal our librarian and the joint convener of this webinar and the team behind him for taking all the responsibilities in arranging this webinar this webinar was mainly organized for the benefits of researchers and faculty members the webinar aims to create awareness among the issues related to intellectual property rights the chosen topic is a need of our nowadays we are quite familiar with the terms copyright patent trademark etc we also know the term ip here but i think all of us should agree with me many of us have very few knowledge about this as far as i know about ipr is that intellectual property is a product of human intellect it is a creation of human minds so this property need to be protected also this field is specially relevant for the researchers and academicians as we have most creative outputs in the form of our publications and inventions so it is very necessary to understand 
the different types of IP rights that we have. And at the same time, how do we protect them? It may be a little tough for us to get into the core of the matter, but still we need to know it. This webinar is intended to cover various components of intellectual property rights so that our participants get more insight on this topic. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope all of us will really benefit from this session. Thank you, Madhurima. Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munshi, for your discourse. And now, again, okay, not delaying you. much, I would like to uh, request Dr. Ramkrishna Prasad Chakraborty, Principal, KK Dash College, for the formal commencement of the proceeding to the webinar. So, over to you. Hello? Hello? Hello, sir? Hello? Sir, you are not audible. Uh, hello, sir? Sir, you are not audible. I think there is some technical problem, sir. Hello, sir? Yes, sir. Hello, doctor. Uh, yes, I, I think now I am audible. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar on behalf of Kekadas College. I am welcoming you from the core of our heart. A participant, 140 registered participant from our country and abroad. Though they are not attend till now. And our respective resource person of the day from whom will enjoy the next couple of hours and to know about the intellectual property rights from the standpoint of law. I wish success of this webinar, what our organizer, in particularly the librarian and his team organizes this webinar. Thank you, Pritam and Nashima and all the team members. And thanks to my colleague and the resource persons for managing their time to deliver the lecture here. And all participants, and with a simple request, I conclude my lecture. Please don't ask for the link of the feedback. When the lecture is on, please don't ask for the feedback link, which will be given in the proper time, and the certificate will be issued simultaneously. So thank you very much for joining here. And over to Madhuri. Thank you, sir. Thank you for formally beginning the webinar. And now, without uh, any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker of this evening, Ms. Paromita Dasgupto. Uh, well, uh, I don't think she needs any introduction, but yet, since it is a formality, I'll have to do that. And I'll do this on her behalf. Uh, well, Ms. Dasgupta has been associated with National University of Judicial Sciences, Kolkata, as a member of the faculty since January 2014. She is a qualified advocate enrolled with the bar since 2007. She has a breadth of experience in litigation and dispute resolution, as well as substantial research-based academic exposure, both at the national and international level. She is an alumna of NUJS Kolkata since 2007. And she has begun her practicing career with the with litigation team of Messrs. Amarchand and Mangaldas Mumbai before proceeding to earn her LNM with high merit from Queen Mary University of London 2010. She specialized in international and comparative intellectual property laws. Since then, she has had the opportunity of being associated with various prestigious governmental and non-governmental research outputs across multiple jurisdictions globally. 
at nujs mrs dasgupta has been consistently in course design and evolution of various undergraduate courses offered at the university in addition to the she also contributes regularly to various acclaimed academic journals both nationally and internationally with her research interests covering the policy interface between intellectual property laws and human rights now well uh, it was a brief i i hope i have uh, um, correctly and rightly introduced you if if anything has been wrong, matlab said wrongly please pardon uh, me and my colleagues so uh, uh, without much again delay i would like you ma'am to continue the uh, talk she would be speaking on a brief introduction to iprs history and development ma'am uh, ma'am das gupta good afternoon everybody Hello. Uh, am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am right um first of all thank you very much indeed um to the entire team at the um kekedas uh, college for organizing this for taking this initiative um at the same time uh, i definitely would be amiss if i did not um, specifically um thank and commend mr paul dr paul uh, and uh, dr munshi dr uh, kole and uh, honorable principal sir am i audible yes madam yeah ma'am you are uh, audible but there is some uh, fine 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 for their for their warm welcome um i would like to uh, clarify a few uh, key things first right uh, i would like to clarify a few things first now uh, i gather from the introductory comments that the vast majority of the audience members happen to be uh, members of academia and therefore understandably they might be more interested in delving deeper into the copyright aspects and and related issues um whereas my brief um is to provide you more with an overview of the different avenues of intellectual property uh, rights and the entire discourse that it covers so it will be covering a broad breadth it uh, it will not be going very deep into any specific avenue and uh, exclusive discussion exclusive in depth discussion pertaining to copyright laws and um, its its uh, its various uh, nuances um, specifically will be taken up by professor mazumdar uh, in the second lecture hour so this is something that i wanted to clarify right at the outset now um if uh, dr paul could kindly um get the slides rolling uh we could begin yes ma'am is is the presentation on no ma'am not yet showing that he is thinking mm -hmm. madam you can start now okay i'm not being able to okay just a second please maybe uh why is why are slides not being visible to me just a second anyway um i i'm going to i'm going to start anyway and as we proceed from one slide to the other i'll just let you know so i think um, we should be able to coordinate that way right um moving to i believe everybody has already taken a look at the first slide which is basically uh the the ambit of the brief that we are covering a very brief introduction to intellectual property rights and once again i stress on the brief aspect of it uh the second we move quickly on to the second slide wherein um uh, you can see we are talking about determinants now um carrying forward from um this uh, a few very very um 
interesting comments that Dr. Munshi had made, um, that she's, she was indeed very right in very succinctly uh, explaining to you uh, what exactly, in a nutshell, are intellectual um, property assets and hence why they need to be protected, etc., etc. Uh, I would like to basically backtrack from that particular stance. Uh, I would like to backtrack from that particular stance um, in that while it is indeed clear to most of us what intellectual property assets um, include, I believe our conversation would be beginning at a midpoint rather than at the logical starting point if we are not really very well conversant with the whys and the wherefores before jumping into the what and then further further qualifications. Um, so why do we need to propertify these things? How did they come about? What were the different uh, players and dynamics which uh, interacted with one another in order to give birth to this to this system, to this framework, um, where these sort of products and outputs began to be looked upon as commodifiable, bona fide assets. And how did that entire market psychology metamorphose into what we are very familiar with today? So I... I hope it will it, within the within the, the limitations of of time that we have and the fact that we, we will be not proceeding beyond an overview i do hope that you will be uh, given some degree of appreciation regardless of what background you come from uh, and uh, an and overall understanding um, of the of the psychology behind the propertification, if I can use such term, the propertification of intellectual assets. Now, uh, as you can see, the, the, the key points, early market structures, the rise of monopoly, emergence of competition, and then finally, how that particular competition and monopoly, these two tensions in, began to interact with one another in the guise of, and, and this is just an illustration of lettuce pattern. There are many others. Uh, lettuce pattern seems to be the most popular and the most well-known amongst people, and hence that selection. Moving to slide number three, uh, as you can see, largely Victorian, uh, we're talking about the ancient marketplace. So human beings, from as far as, as far back as we can remember, we have been a particularly uh, well social, talkative, uh, mutually interactive, and a, a sort of a pack mentality animals. Right? Uh, we do fare better than many others in terms of surviving on our own, but we did realize very early on that that survival would be very basic and very fleeting, in, in other words, not very long lasting, if we were to be left to our own devices and at the mercies of you know, the, the ravages of nature. So that is when we, we hit upon this, this, this very bright idea that if we were to live as pack animals, we had a greater chance of survival, we had a greater uh, chance of the sustainability of that survival, and also the quality of life that we would then get to enjoy would be significantly better, significantly more comfortable than what we would be able to fend for ourselves. Uh, this led to the, and this is this is all, of course, uh, very very brief and uh, in an, in a bird's eye view fashion. So this led to the birth of. Um, the clan or the tribal structures where people began to group together based on certain elements of mutual affiliation uh, in order to, in, in, with, with, with a tacit compact with one another, to bring to the table whatever their own strengths were, pool those strengths together in order to be able to stave off or collectively fight against what would then come out as the collective weaknesses. Um, History has been witness to the fact that this was indeed a stroke of genius. Um, anthropologists, social scientists, historians, um, they, they will all testify to the fact that this was perhaps the singularly greatest um, sort of um, social, societal, uh, psychological breakthrough uh, that humankind has ever hit upon. And, and I say that advisedly, uh, not including the wheel, the fire, etc., etc. Um, 
So as we begin to get more and more comfortable with interdependence, with uh, helping one another, getting help from one another, uh, it begins to take more and more layered, nuanced, and slightly more complex shapes, more, more tactile shapes, more, more tangible shapes. And enter the concept of a marketplace rather than uh, a very communal uh, setup wherein um, those of you who are who are uh, law students who are lawyers are familiar with the expressions rest communists right so the rights of the commune uh, everything belongs to everybody hence nothing belongs to any one person so it's all it's all ours and none of it is mine right so as time passes, we begin to see a gradual inching away or a, or a gradual discomfiture with this classic rest communist model, which is something which was the hallmark of pre-civilizational um, human interaction. To the point when people really began to show a marked preference for something other than the classic rest communist model. In other words, we wanted to own something. We wanted to hold something exclusively, exclusively meaning to the exclusion of all others. So rest nullius uh, being the flip side of rest communist uh, is something which was no longer sitting very well with us as, as a race, as, as a culture. Uh, we began to feel that uh, not all our needs desires, requirements, and expressions were, were entirely homogeneous. And as a result of which, that heterogeneity or that uniqueness or that specificity of requirement, desire, or output or personality needed to be captured or acknowledged or serviced in some, some tangible way. As a result, we hit upon the idea of propertification. So until this point in time, you had resources. Resources were there at the disposal of all, whoever could make the most of it, and then it would be shared amongst everybody. Now, from resources, we are moving to the next level when we are eyeing the possibility of property, of ownership, right? Um, and inherent within that is the element of exclusion. So it is no longer all ours. What is mine is mine because it is not yours. Right. So that is that is the inherent concept behind propertification. The, the first element of a negative couching of a particular entitlement in order to give it the force of a right. OK, so and it's, it's very interesting that the way it, it develops and the ancient marketplace, the picture that you see in front of you uh, is um, is your classic barter uh, situation where where people are, have have converged in a, in a designated spot with their own their, their wares uh, to exchange for whatever value those particular wares might command on merit in said marketplace. Um, so. The first thing that we see is we are moving away from a, a communi communal community structure to a more uh, exclusionary individualistic structure. We are um, showing great proclivity towards the, the birth of the logic or the, the cult of propertification. In other words, exclusionary and exclusive enjoyment of goods and services. And in order to push that barrier, push the envelope further, what we also begin to see is an element of gauging for oneself as to what one requires and what one doesn't. So a greater expression of individual tastes, um, individual autonomy in that sense. For instance, uh, I no longer need to be ruled by the dictates of the clan chiefs and the elders who say that, okay, we shall all be wearing uh, garments which have been dyed green, let's say. And we shall all be consuming a particular kind of food. And we shall all be engaging in a particular kind of uh, lifestyle. So that degree of blanket homogeneity is gradually being chipped away uh, at the altar of greater individual self-expression. Right? Uh, so if I feel like having a certain kind of diet, I shall go out and procure the same for myself in exchange for certain, something that I might sell at a profit. Uh, if I wish to drape um, a, a garment which is not green, which is maybe red or blue, I shall go forth and do so because that is what I wish to do. So the element of um, gratifying one's um, self-expression is something which is beginning to, very unconsciously, very unconsciously, of course, but it's beginning to crystallize um, along with the birth of this notion of propertification. 
as a result of which not only do we have the concept of exchanging goods i have something in surplus i don't require th- these many but you have something which i would i would really desire really covet so what i'm willing to do is i'm willing to give you off some of the extra stuff that i have which you might which you might decide if you if you require and in exchange i would like to have some of those things which you have made but i can't right so pooling from pooling of mutual strengths we are not now looking at um, exchanging of of mutual mutual assets and uh, instead of instead of, of of blanket pooling and within that we are beginning to see the element of assertion of taste and assertion of taste basically is includes a subjective element within the otherwise purely objective and mathematical um stresses and strains which were which would have otherwise run a perfect marketplace so the the birth of marketplace and the birth of self assertion and um, and expression of one's uh, pers- unique personality and desires and and capabilities also so there is a fly in every ointment as we can see also comes into play uh, the element of imperfect nature of the inherently imperfect nature of the marketplace and as we shall go forward in the next slide slide number 4 uh when we move on from the ancient times to the medieval times where while a lot has ostensibly changed in terms of lifestyle and culture and and uh, the beliefs and articulation of people much has remained the same in terms of core psychology in other words barter is or is still being seen uh, in some way is still being seen as a very reliable uh, methodology of self replenishment at a profit uh what has also however crept into the picture is no longer are we exclusively bartering in goods so i have six eggs of which i need three so i give you the three extra and in return you give me uh, maybe um two 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 stacks of corn right um so instead of instead of this this direct one on one barter which while is extremely satisfying at the individual level also does a lot to destabilize or take away from the uh, let's say universal standardization right uh, of the overall market dynamic so what was felt would be uh, very beneficial in the sense so it would it would still satiate the core um, satisfaction that one derives from a barter setup without necessarily um, wob- rendering wobbly the the standardized uh, foundation of the market dynamic is the element of uniform uniform currency right so we have the birth of uniform currency which basically facilitates the barter but in a standardized manner now what that does also is while it is it is still allowing one uh, the freedom of going forth and deciding what they wish to procure and deciding what they wish to put out in the marketplace it is also working in 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 a in a very subtle but a very effective way uh, to standardize to e- e- externally standardize the element of taste which so far had been very very intimately personal i think that this red garment will suit me better than the green garment so i go out to procure a red garment for myself somebody else might be of a completely different opinion they might feel that the red garment looks absolutely hideous on me and for that matter the red garment um is actually very substandard it hasn't been made in a in a in a good enough manner the finish is not good the color is not good etc etc right so it all depends on the individual person so i liked the garment i went and bought it someone thinks it's absolute waste of uh, you know resources and they they give it no further thought so what that does is there is no standardization of quality why because everything is dependent on individual tastes now what the the advent of currency does is because you have a standard um, conduit because you have a standard uh, medium in which so it, it's it's like having a uniform language because you have a standard medium in which you speak so that medium can be quantified and calibrated to showcase approval or disapproval so what that does is the absolute subjectivity of taste which had so far rested exclusively on the individual now becomes more and more broad based and the community as a whole gets to have a say in what they collectively think to be 
a product which has merit and a product which doesn't or a product which has less merit right so and that brings to the fore the element of pricing the element of differential pricing higher pricing lower pricing pricing being an indicator of demand and supply pricing being an being an indicator of which particular good um, is being lauded and and encouraged and for and further desired you know, by a greater number of the public so not only are we exchanging goods we are also keeping a very sharp eye out for the qualitative factor and have also created uh, a largely uh, objective and invariant frame of reference to keep track and to keep a record of this changing tastes and desires of society and how this market structure is constantly adjusting to respond to and cater to these 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 waves these rises and falls and ebbs um, of of taste of which which you might call demand a rise in demand a fall in demand etc etc uh, so the medieval marketplace uh, while retaining many of the features of the ancient marketplace at its core brings with itself these added accoutrements as a result of which it becomes in a way more sophisticated but also in a way a lot more simplified and standardized and universalized in terms of understanding the relative merits of goods and products okay um now if we move to slide number 5 you see it's still a, a medieval marketplace but you see the difference between slide 4 and slide 5 so slide 4 is is looking at a marketplace which is largely uh, self serving self contained self reliant people from the nearby villages have come in pooled their goods and uh, made the made the best seller or the best uh, producer or the best goods win basically whereas in the second slide when we talk about the medieval marketplace part 2 what you see uh, this is again for for those of you interested we are looking at uh, a venetian courtyard so as um, you may be you may be aware that at towards the final days of what is uh, officially known as the, the medieval ages in in in, in europe the large large swathes of the western culture also blended into the early days of um, the enlightenment the renaissance and um, many things characterize this particular era uh, the, the the biggest hallmark of which was um, original thinking um, a, a great um, encouragement given to broad mindedness uh, lateral thinking thinking out of the box coming up with novel ideas uh, basically becoming a little more uh, outgoing a little more daring and a little more audacious in terms of pushing the bounds of one's intellect and uh, not really being confined by uh, trappings of convention simply i mean for no reason other than the fact that well that's how things have always been so that was felt to be no longer a good enough reason people were venturing forth this change in in the mindset was reflecting uh, in every aspect of of one's of one's life so people were venturing forth in terms of how they chose to uh, look at the world how they chose to look at their lives uh, how they chose to dress themselves how they chose to feed themselves how they chose to run their societies how they chose to conduct trade uh, so every aspect of life right from the micro to the macro uh, was not left untouched by this fundamental shift in thinking so everything everything uh, was was a desire to be bigger better broader um and and curiosity knew no bounds because for the first time people had begun to venture further afield to look at other domains other principalities other kingdoms um engage with other cultures look into other styles of trading and governance and militia etc etc and uh, of course all of this was brought about because at this age you see there has been a, a significant fall in the constant warfare and strife that had characterized much of the early um, and the, and the mid middle ages and people people were beginning to realize the wisdom that there was much more to be gained by collaboration than by conflict um, so that was a big reason why people felt safe and secure enough um, to venture further afield to look at at uh, "Quote unquote foreign um, you know, ways of living and and conducting life, and maybe to take a leaf out of their book if if that did seem like a good idea, which which was perhaps lacking at home. So this 
fundamental idea was the single biggest push, the single biggest fill uh, after the, that first uh, aha moment that we had had when we realized that it was better to live together than to live apart. Uh, this, is, this is the second such great milestone where people realize that collaboration, regardless of what guise it came in, regardless of what the modalities of said collaboration were, but collaboration any day was a lot less expensive, a lot more beneficial, a lot more durable and a lot more stable in the long run than any model of conflict. And, and trust me, by now, these people were veterans in all forms of conflict. Um, wars, skirmishes, loots, plunders. I mean, they had seen it all. So when they felt that no matter what form of conflict and, and governance by assertion of might that had been the norm in much of these, uh, many of these countries, regardless of what that model was and regardless of how happy the eventual outcome may have been, collaboration was infinitely safer, infinitely cheaper, infinitely more profitable and infinitely more long lasting, ergo stable than any of these other models that uh, civilization uh, so far had seen. It was really being sort of hit by uh, a bolt of lightning. And everything else began to follow very, very quickly because that same logic was being applied to exponentially increase and enhance every facet of an individual's life. Like I said, from the very personal and the intimate right up to how uh, nation states were being run. Um, as a result of which, people began to push for better, for grander, for uh, show me something I haven't seen before. So this tendency, which was significantly absent in the previous eras, began to become more and more of a hallmark of the late medieval and the, the early Renaissance era. Uh, the thirst for um, being, being, being surprised, the thirst for being astonished, the thirst for being amazed. So not only were we looking at a populous or... Um, a market which was um, basically and fundamentally utilitarian. In other words, these are certain goods that we require, and this is what we have, so let's just make do with it. So society, as we saw in this particular age, had moved on from merely being content with making do to wanting to make do better, to wanting to thrive and not just survive. You see, uh, so the, the emphasis on better, 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 better just kept amplifying. So what are we saying? In other words, the element of individual taste, which had been sat, uh, standardized to some extent in the early Middle Ages with the advent of currency and uh, sort of putting certain broad straitjacketing rules on how the market was supposed to conduct itself was now in for yet another self-reinvention. In other words, this standardization was about to be severely disrupted by this element of constant thirsting and this relentless thirsting for enhanced merit, enhanced quality. So standardization was still there. You still had currency. But at the same time, it was no longer dependent or no longer being dictated only by uh, necessity or the, the, the most basic kind of necessity, basically. In other words, uh, what are the staples that grow here? We have rice, we have wheat, and we have corn. Um, so fine, let's, let's just have a bushel of one, one of each, and then we are done. Now we have a situation where, well, you want rice. We have rice from three different provinces within the country. We have rice from four different provinces from a different state, uh, three different provinces from within the state, four provinces from other states, and maybe seven provinces from other countries. Now you have all of these varieties. All of these are rice. Now you take a call on which variety of rice you would like to invest this amount of currency into. So what is what it is doing is it is bringing to the fore, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to call it consumerism because that really hasn't begun as of yet. But what has happened is this unabashed um, exaltation, so to speak, and encouragement of assertion 
and expression and gratification via investment of currency of individual tastes, wants, and desires. Now, if you understand what is going on here, it is a constant push and pull. So from being peculiarly individual driven, we were lauding the advent of currency because it helped standardize. Now, what is happening once more is again the rise of the cult of the individual customer, of the individual tastes. But we already have a standardized system. So what it's now doing is instead of completely destabilizing, as had been the case prior to currency, pre-currency, what it is doing is it is playing within. So we are still coloring within the boundaries, but the quality of the colors are now much more vibrant. So we are not really that keen on destabilizing the macro pillars of the market uh, structure per se, but we are more interested in sort of leveling up of what the market itself stands for. In other words, if you were to think of, let's say, um, think, of, think of a huge uh, automobile which has been stuck in mud. All right. So the contours of the automobile remain the same. Nothing is being shifted. The, the truck doesn't suddenly become a Jeep. But if you were to, let's say, uh, drudge in, drudge in certain, uh, you know, uh, heavy machinery in order to lever the automobile out from the muck. So what is happening is it is leveling upwards while retaining its basic contours. Its qualitative enhancement is taking place. But its fundamental shape is already ripe enough to not be destabilized any further. See, so a, a vertical um, change was taking place. Um, and this was a change for the positive, as was seen, because the money kept rushing into the coffers. Um, uh, kings and princes and, and heads of state marveled at the fact um, that they could really make this kind of an income without having to uh, raise an army without having to incur the costs of warfare, uh, without having to strain um, their peasants, their peasantry, uh, their, their uh, subjects for war taxes, for uh, loss of lives, able-bodied men being lost in war. So almost none of the overheads with almost as much as one would gain in a particularly good favorable campaign. But then again, with campaigns, you never knew what the outcome would be. If you got to win, then you might go forth and loot and plunder and bring back, uh, you know, great wealth for your coffers. But if you lost, the converse would be your fate. Whereas here, the variables are milder, the consequences are softer, and the possibility or the, the guarantee of a happy possibility, the probability of the same is much higher, exponentially higher than what one was accustomed to in the tried and tested methods of enriching one's own country. What happened, however, along with this, uh, if you could move to the next slide, please, slide number six. Uh, what happened along with this, so with this, with this realization hitting the governed as well as the governors, uh, the kings, the, the rulers, the heads of state, the, the, the senior members of the guild who basically shaped and ran the marketplace, and maintain some element of status quo, along with the interaction of this well-heeled uh, new class of, of tradesmen who went forth, traveled to foreign nations, saw how, how tra trade and commerce were conducted, would bring exotic goods back, and then would, would uh, make it available for the uh, hitherto um, you know, inexperienced uh, consumer base. So now we have the rise of these, these more exposed customers who have a greater and a more um, confident um, say on what they like and what they definitely don't like. And with more and more people uh, gravitating towards certain kinds of goods, and again, investing currency, basically buying with money instead of bartering. Uh, so there is a record being kept of which goods are doing better, which goods are doing worse, what does the market want? Which way is the market shifting? What is the mood of the public, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, so, and at, at this particular point in time, what these tradespersons as well as uh, the ruling classes begin to understand is people are no longer being bound or driven by 
need based decisions because thankfully um, a, a, an age of prosperity had had long since lasted and people were really not that thirsted or not that deprived of the basic necessities people were more interested in going for things and there were certain commonalities even though people had their own tastes there were certain commonalities that certain goods were indeed doing much better than the others and what was the common feature or the common pattern among all the goods that were doing well they responded to a certain quality above head and shoulders above the other competing goods in the marketplace right so what people hit upon was the fact it was no longer the presence of the good no longer the ease of availability of the good exclusively or the fact that it was in my in my hometown or in the nearest village etc etc which was the single biggest determining factor of merit but something called this this elusive something called quality right so people were thirsting after quality goods people were people were more than happy to shell out maybe a little bit extra for a good whose merit spoke for itself as a result of which people began to become more and more loyal or attached to certain kinds of goods or to uh, or to goods emanating from a certain producer or a certain part of the country or a certain country in the world for instance uh, silks from china right spices from india uh, so so these were these were goods which regardless of how alien the end consumer may be to the nature or the origin of that particular product and the life of that product nevertheless the merit of the product spoke for itself to such a degree that uh trade merchants in in rome and venice um could could make a killing out of uh these these kinds of uh, of, of products right so the understanding was very clear that it is not just something to get by but the best that money can buy so what do we mean by this repeated use of these words merit quality the best that money can buy i want to live better i want to know better i want to i want to broaden my horizons so what i'm constantly seeing time and time again emanating out of this this new age of people this new era of thinking is the fact that there is something beyond the mere corporeal presence of the product per se in other words there are bricks and then there are bricks but i want to have those bricks that are coming from that particular kiln those bricks made by that particular man so what is special about this the man must be having a certain way let's say of uh, you know uh, cooking his his bricks for a little bit longer there might be something he adds an extra to the mixture of the products that other men don't which probably gives his bricks a certain extra durability or maybe a trademark very pretty color uh mind you we we use the word trademark in a very generic sense now but we, that is what we are getting at uh, so a, a quintessential color or maybe a quintessential durability or maybe a a particular trait um which is peculiar of the bricks coming out of a kiln of all the kilns owned by that particular man uh so as he begins to realize that whatever it is that he has been doing out of you know trial and error for some reason has caught the fancy of the customers has caught the fancy of the marketplace he realizes that he needs to do something to make sure that other people who are quick to catch on to the fact that the market is indeed responding to these kind of products over other kinds of bricks so that the consumers are not deflected or fooled right by people by somebody who has basically uh, tried to copy what he had been working on for years and years and years before he hit upon this winning formula he decides to distinguish his products his bricks from anybody else's bricks he decides to emboss his own initials on every cake of brick that comes out of the kiln so what has he done he has basically done something which shepherds and goat herds and uh, cattle rearers had been doing for centuries he has branded his product right so he has distinguished his product with something which is quintessentially and unmistakably relatable and connectable to him as the source or the producer and the only producer 
of that particular quality of product right so with the constant relentless emphasis on quality and particular kinds of quality what also began to arise was the need to distinguish a certain uh, basket of offerings from similar and maybe confusable baskets of competing offerings so we are looking at the element of competition having crept in we are looking at the element of uh, branding coming in we are looking at the element of brand loyalty coming in right along with branding you see brand loyalty because so people now know that that is the original producer of those bricks which i had seen in so and so's house and had admired i want one of my, some for myself right so branding and branding for what brand, no, you're not branding it just the way the goat herds and the shepherds were doing you're branding for trade right so you're marking it for the purpose of trade so that your trade doesn't get adversely affected by somebody's uh, let's say plagiarism of your winning formula so good faith prevails what you have worked for you get the just rewards for and you continue holding the consumer base or the admirer base that the merit of your product had legitimately elicited from the marketplace so you begin to see the birth of branding you begin to see the birth of a uh, trademark and propertification of not just a good per se but some intangible extra x factor quality which the, each of these goods are embodied now if you think even further you are you, the question begs itself what exactly is this x factor quality that people keep talking about why is it that somebody wants his goods because his goods have certain extra qualities how did those extra qualities come to be i mean isn't there a standard formula of making bricks of course there is so why is it that mr x's bricks are uh, in such high demand like i said maybe mr x's bricks are prettier they last longer they don't break that easily um and maybe he has some sort of a of a mechanical formula whereby his turnout is bigger and and better uh, so all of these things haven't just happened so mr x definitely has spent usually not just months but years and years perfecting this winning combination this winning formula that has not just been a product of formulaic application of just how to make a brick right so he has invested his toil he has invested his time he has invested significant resources and most importantly he has invested an element of his own creativity so he decided he took the final call when he was trying out different formulae different temperatures different mixtures for his brick he took the final call when he decided no i think this is a great formula and i'm going to go forward and i'm going to make the batch on this formula and not the one that i had done 15 days back so he takes a call as to which is the quote on quote winning formula as per his own creative instincts now of course we are talking about brick laying brick making here so the margin or the possibility for individual creativity is is finite it's limited if we were to talk about something much more creative less utilitarian much more aesthetic much more ornamental then the scope for individual creativity and the expression of the unique expression of the producer the creator the artist or the author would be that much greater right so what we begin to see with uh, slide number 6 when a new market emerges is the new market is not just it's it's not just dictated by a, a, a profusion of goods or the fact that these goods are exotic but also a whole different way of looking at purchase a whole different way of looking at sale a whole different way of looking at what makes a market tick and in other words inter alia what makes a nation rich right so all of these are having these it's it's like a chain reaction they, they keep having these uh these continuous consequences and if you move to the next slide we begin to see that after the new market has emerged and people have hit upon the notion that it is not only the presence of the corporeal good only but the element of creativity the element of innovation the element of um individual uh thumbprint of the of the creator which is what is setting a good apart 
from many others of its ilk, we see that notion being grasped and proliferated at a massive, massive level when we look at this particular slide, which is the age of industrialization, right? Uh, now, this is a different kind of enlightenment, uh, different from the, the era of the Renaissance. It's a different kind of enlightenment, but it is the age of, uh, people say, the age of the applic applicative sciences. So people are very much open to unique thinking, to creative thinking, but within certain parameters. And what um, the, uh, the, the age of Renaissance had, had seen, not just in, in the sciences, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in trade, in governance, but also in the arts and literature, the same thread, thread is being carried forward in this, in this particular era as well, but it is expressed in a different manner. It is becoming much more state-run uh, and not just individuals basically trying out different things um, you know, to see what works. It is not that less affair anymore. Uh, there is a huge element of uh, background rules and regulations because the market is now a much older entity. People have already realized certain things that do work. In a, in a market structure for a large number of stakeholders and they would like to keep those things constant whereas allowing the margin of variables to then sort of play out amongst themselves so we usher in the age of industrialization where uh, not only are we looking at individual creativity but we are also looking at and, and com competition at a micro uh, level but we are looking at all of these elements but being blown up multiple uh, i mean several thousands of times and something again to take a page out of venice something which the daughters of venice uh, which the 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 medicis of florence and um, which with 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 the uh, the leaders of, of, of Milan and Naples, they had, uh, they had found great success with is something which is now being appropriated by pretty much all major industrial powers in the world which is the state steps in and becomes a major player and not just a player but a regulator of sorts in not only assisting or, or, or augmenting this environment of creative thinking and uh, entrepreneurship and innovation but also having a say in shaping uh, or, or giving a slight, slight, slight nudge to what indeed is the final stamp of superior quality. In other words, it is now no longer just the individual or a marketplace which is being determined just by how many people flock to a particular stall, but the state coming in and adding its own two bits to saying what it thinks is the most superior and qualitatively sound product in this particular range of goods. So what do we see here? We see the, the birth of um, sanctions. In other words, not only do you have a producer or a creator emblazoning or branding the products with his initials, there is one level higher than that. You might have, let's say, the mark of a guild, which says that, yes, not only is, is so-and-so a bona fide producer of these, these kinds of products, but also we as guild seniors um, accredit the fact that the manner in which he has gone about doing this is also qualitatively sound. So it might look very nice to you. Uh, it might seem like a very pretty product, but maybe if you, if you were to take it home, it could have certain other undesirable effects and something you are not in a position to judge for yourself because you're not well trained in that, in that particular skill. But we as guild seniors are vouching for so the element of vouching for comes in, and this is an added voice, right? Adding to the sort of uh, the conversation that had been going on in a more or less linear manner between the, the seller and the buyer, basically. So there's an added voice that comes in, acting as a sort of an, uh, a referee or an arbiter of, uh, you know, vouching for so-and-so's goods. You know, somebody, a third person coming and saying, saying, no, no, I, I speak for this, this man. What he's selling you is good. You can take it in good faith. Now, what happens in this in this industrial um, age is that entire setup just goes one notch higher. 
So in this cacophony, which has already been created by the guild members and the seniors and the and the product manufacturers and the consumers, so all of them having a conversation, a new voice that comes in is that of the state itself. In some cases, that's the crown. In some cases, that's the government. But the state comes in saying that, um, well, if the guilds can be can vouch for quality up to a certain level, what stops uh, the ultimate sovereign to decide what is arguably or unarguably, depending on uh, what your worldview is, um, is the absolute best product in this particular uh, particular category or absolute best service in this particular category. So a very elaborate reward system, which had been tried out with uh, great success in, in uh, Renaissance, um, the, the Italian states that I just mentioned, is something which, which began to be embraced with tremendous uh, you know um, eagerness by these these major industrial powers who also incidentally happened to be um, major imperialist powers as well so uh, let that that historical uh, political element not be lost um, on on those of you who are trying to form the links um, and and what they come up with is some sort of a charter so the lettuce pattern, the expression that I'd used uh, above, is an example of the same. Uh, or maybe, uh, which is very common, if, if you are if you are familiar with, uh, since this is India and and we we do follow common law, you are you might be familiar with this, um, where certain goods and goods and products on their on their packaging, they say um, by commission of to Her Majesty the Queen. Or a special commission to so basically that shows that not only do we carry all the necessary accreditations from our own studio, from our own factory, from the guild seniors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also we have been permitted to advertise the fact that we provide this particular service to the sovereign. So what's good enough for the queen is it not good enough for you? So that is the new angle that comes into the picture. In trademark, that's how it plays out. You have added seals, which you are allowed to add to the final packaging of your goods. In copyright, uh, <clears throat> again, which will, which will be explained in, in much, much uh, detail by, by Professor Mazumdar. But a small example would be, let's say, a reward system. You, 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 um, you recognize somebody, let's say, as the poet laureate of a particular country. You confer certain certain prizes and certain uh, you know um, awards on an individual. So what is that? That is a recognition of your artistry, of your skill. So you might have been selling uh, you might have been selling bestsellers, you know, for the last twenty five years, and uh, maybe it was well known within your region. Then what happens? Your publishers decide to go global. They decide to try to 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 sell your books in different languages and. Um, and, and test it out in other marketplaces where the culture might be different, where the tastes of reading might be a little bit different, and so it's it's a bit of a touch and go, right? Uh, you might you might find some open-minded readers, and you might not find people who might say that no, no, this is culturally too different. I, it's it's not really my taste. And then suddenly you are given an award, a, a grand award, let's say a Legion d'honneur or or a, or a Padma Shri or. Um, let's say like i said you become a poet laureate and that makes waves and people who had been in two minds about i really don't know uh, you know the culture that he comes from the kind of books he writes or the genre that he uh, practices i don't really know if that's that's my my taste even a, a segment of those people out of sheer curiosity oh, oh well a poet laureate a padma shri what is it about him must be something special. What is it? Let, let me let me buy his latest book. Let me see what he's all about. So what that happens is it further amps up the perceived credibility. It's all about perception at the end of the day, right? I might feel when I'm putting in some element of my own um, artistic capability, of my own ingenuity, uh, of my own creativity, to me, that might definitely appear to be the best thing uh, I ever saw. But... Uh, Ironically enough, for creative goods, the more creative the goods are, basically, which means the, the more that you have poured out of yourself into a particular product, ironically, uh, it is the lesser and lesser control you have on the final fate of how that product will be regarded. Why? Because it will then be sent out to the public for their consumption, for their uh, 
pleasure and finally for their verdict so the self actualization of the journey of an artist or a creative person again we have moved a long way from uh, brick making as you can see um, so ironically brick making uh, the 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 parameters of of response were a lot clearer you really knew what were the boxes that you were trying to tick whereas the more creative the product is the more it takes out of you and the lesser you know as to uh, where you're going with it and how it will finally be be received whether or not your labors your creativity your talents your emotions that you have poured into this particular work will indeed receive the kind of love that uh, you would want it to receive that is what it basically boils down to any 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 artistic endeavor so you see the state stepping in is making waves and basically adding a heightened layer of perceived quality in different avenues so in trademarks i told you how that happens in in copyright and the arts we just looked at this particular example the third is when we're talking about patents does the state step in the state can the state does in some cases directly in most cases indirectly by setting up certain regimes a certain by regimes we are talking about certain uh, a climate of rules within which the marketplace has to function and the people who are the, the top dogs within that particular structure will need to adhere to those rules in order to um, differentially qualify which product is to be deemed um, as worthy of a a monopoly recognition and which is not so which takes us to our next slide slide number 8 consumerism and monopolies so as you can see we are looking at a particularly uh, decadent uh, scene here where uh, this is the height of hedonism and people are basically enjoying themselves having a good time uh, trying to you know procure for themselves uh, the best that is available and basically doing nothing other than or nothing beyond than simply enjoying themselves and that is and this is the key point that is not something which unlike the early medieval ages or the ancient ages it is not something which is being frowned upon it is something which is becoming rapidly the new normal and something which the market dynamic and in many cases the establishment itself is tacitly encouraging so why not have a good time why not go out and give yourself a good time why not try this particular brand of uh, uh, perfume it makes you feel good does it not uh, why not try this new restaurant that is opened up uh, we hear the chef is marvelous so what we are trying to do here is yes we are trying to augment and trying to encourage the creative output of these individuals who are trying out these different goods and services in the marketplace but the manner in which that we are doing so is by encouraging further consumption varied consumption and more next slide discerning consumption the reason why this particular picture has been chosen as many of you will recognize this is uh, the late uh, great hollywood uh, actress and philanthropist audrey hepburn uh, but this particular picture has been chosen uh, because it is it is it's been taken from a, a film of hers called breakfast at tiffanys right now as many of you might know tiffanys is um a, a jewelry manufacturer right it's 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 a it's a it's an up, upper end higher end jewelry uh, store in in new york they have branches um, all over the world but the reason why i selected that is again if you if you if you read the seen the movie or you have read the plot you would know that how the name tiffany it's, it's a brand name nothing else right and again uh, those of you who are familiar those of you who are familiar with uh, with uh, uh, pantone color schemes you are also familiar with a particular shade of blue called tiffany blue so all of these are basically spin offs on a super successful uh, or or super success of a brand so there are lots of very talented jewelers who uh, make their ornaments out of the best quality diamonds and the best quality metals and they have great artistry and and the great craftsmen but what i'm saying is this is the kind of sort of um, immortality in popular culture when uh, a, a, a very a more relatable example would be the word google right um when a noun becomes a verb you do realize 
that a brand has indeed succeeded every test of that particular age. You no longer say, I am going to Google to search for something. You say, I'm going to Google it, right? So the, the, minute, the minute that transformation happens, so Breakfast at Tiffany's was just an example. The minute that transformation happens, if you could move to slide number 10, please. Uh, the minute the transformation happens, you realize that the exercise of branding or the consumer's, consumer psychology behind branding has succeeded. And the only way it can succeed is when there is a constant interaction between demand and supply at the qualitatively heightened and sophisticated level as the market demands. Excuse me, Pritam. Please present again the screen. Pritam. Hello, Pritam. Okay, okay. Right. Can I continue? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as I was saying, if you, if you, uh, slide number ten, please. Slide number ten. Um, if you look at slide number ten, what you see is a picture of one of the. I mean, again, we all have shopping malls in every city, in every town, in 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 the world right now. But this is one of the earliest. It's 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 a it's a shopping arcade. It's called Gallery Lafayette. Um, so it's 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 in Paris. So it was one of the earliest experiments. Back then, it was an experiment. A departmental store was an experiment. A uh, shopping arcade definitely was an experiment. So how can we boggle, absolutely boggle, and bedazzle the minds of a consumer by, uh, you know, throwing at them? an unprecedented variety and range and um, number, sheer number of goods of very closely comparable quality and then try and see how the market regulates itself. So this is where you can, you can call it uh, the absolute commercial litmus test of an intellectual property. So the element of creativity, the element of genius, the element of exactly how good you are as perceived by your end audience. This is the ultimate litmus test because the person who is selecting the goods, the person who will make that one unit of purchase, more often than not, has zero idea of the technicalities that go into the making of that product. We go and purchase uh, garments, we purchase perfumes, we purchase jewelry. I'm talking about uh, not strictly utilitarian goods, right? How many of us have a working knowledge of what goes into the perfumery industry or how a particular garment is, is put together or, or how does a jeweler practice his craft? How many of us have even the basic working knowledge? We don't. But we don't think twice before deciding that no, I think that piece is better than this one. I'm going to go for that one. That's what I'm going to buy. So what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm acknowledging the creative output of one creator at the cost of another. Right? So that one instance of purchase, that is what it indicates. I buy a ticket to visit the opera, to listen to a, a musical. What am I doing? The price of the ticket is basically my the the non-verbal equivalent of my raising my hand and saying yes i like your work great so it is the the seal of approval that i am giving to the the artist or the creator or the producer at the other end now coming down to how this entire sort of self-regulated market structure is being affected by this new entrant into the picture namely the state or the establishment if we could go to slide number 11 please so here, as you can see, the birth of limited monopolies. Now, uh, as this, uh, I believe this, this is, this is an uh, initiative organized by the, the economics department. And uh, as I believe, one of the fundamental things that you will learn in your eco economics classes is the fact that what happens when, okay, well, may, let's make it simple. Think of a seesaw. Right. So what happens when it is at rest? So there is nobody sitting on either side. It, it self-regulates. Right. There is a fulcrum. 
and then it self regulates then you put a child at one end it goes down you put a child at the other end and then depending on the relative weights of both these children and how these two weights either uh, nullify or interact with one another depending on the tension or the nullification the seesaw will come to some kind of a position it either be straight or to be crooked to it slanted at one end etc etc the market works exactly in the same manner that there are different pushes and pulls the different dynamics which give a particular market its distinctive character and flavor and uh, and well momentum too um, so what is happening here is the state is not only stepping in by uh, allowing you to use its name allowing you to say that yes uh, i i serve chocolates to the queen or saying that uh, you know look at this prize uh, the king gave me this award right it's not stopping at that this is much more intrusive in a sense so what it does is the competition which was anyways not perfect because as we know the marketplace in reality is not a figment of mathematical perfection nothing is because that's reality right so we already have a marketplace where a perfectly level playing field doesn't exist as a result of which the competition that ensues and keeps self replenishing is imperfect nevertheless what we choose to do as the state or as the government is to step in and further disrupt the natural flow of that dynamic by artificially by artificially blocking a certain window of time when a particular player in that marketplace will be able to call the shots because he or she has been able to satisfy uh the awardee the awarder that is the king or the government that their products are indeed of such superlative quality that it indeed deserves to be given this kind of a time bound monopolistic privilege now there are two ways of looking at it one is this is the ultimate you can do as a state by to incentivize creativity so you give such a grand reward to one person for doing something well that everybody else is is bedazzled and they're like wow if this is the reward for you know uh, hard work and and creativity and ingenuity i want that too i want that reward for myself let me try harder let me work a little bit more so what that does is it encourages constructive competition as a result of which from the sovereign's point of view or from the consumer's point of view the market will not only be flooded with more goods but all of those goods even the worst of those goods will conform to a basic minimum standard below which nothing will survive so those goods will just cease to be so the overall standard of the marketplace is going up up and up that is that is one way of looking at it and the manner in which it's being done is by incentivizing and encouraging innovators creative thinkers skilled personnel the other way of looking at it is why are you not allowing the marketplace to find its own level if a good is indeed that good then the consumers will figure it out sooner or later they will flock to that particular product it will make a name for itself right it will acquire its own distinctiveness and as a result of which um if somebody is indeed deserving of that kind of adulation and that kind of reward and and remuneration from the public it will be his it will take a little bit of time but the consequence is the market disruptions the shocks will be so minor that the disruptions will be absorbed in the marketplace whereas if you intrude into the marketplace suddenly saying that okay so and so has created such a wonderful product that it deserves to be given a letters patent recognition as a result of which for the next 20 years he or she will be the only authorized person to sell this particular product at this rate and whoever tries to mimic or sell anything similar the person may be plagiarizing may not be plagiarizing will be penalized why because that is the person who has been awarded a patent recognition and somebody else has not right so this is the ultimate um, illustration of exclusionary enjoyment of um, the propertyification or the commodification of an intellectual asset so i have worked on something i have come up with a winning formula for a particular drug and nowadays any news uh, uh, 
avenue, any news channel, any news uh, platform that you open, the, the the hot topic of discussion is uh, the great race for the COVID nineteen vaccine, right? So, race for what? What is the race about? Is it about oh well, um, people are dying, so let's do it as soon as possible? Partially, unfortunately, not entirely. Partially. Why? The other part is. If I am the first one to hit the jackpot, if I am the first one to file my patent, and I am the first one to make sure that not just one but several countries agree that I am indeed that person who has come come up with the winning formula, then the next twenty years of this particular drug molecule marketplace will be mine to rule the roost, and we are talking of hundreds of millions of dollars, right? so that is the amount of of reward or money or uh, well public resources whichever way you choose to look at it that is at stake here so what had started out as fairly simplistic recognition of one's labor one's talents and and as a sort of an extra a push from a parental uh, authority figure has become something much more complex much more layered much more nuanced and if you pardon my saying so definitely less innocent than what it was envisaged as originally it hasn't been so much the case in the domain of copyright there are aspects of course particularly when you look at artistic copyrights musical copyrights uh, performers rights uh, and and the, the the constant tussle between the, uh, the the production arm and the creative arm uh, and how that interacts with each other so that is an element yes but nowhere perhaps is it more sinister uh, today than in the domain of um, blue chip patents when we're talking about uh, high end technology when we're talking about next generation uh, biopharmaceutical breakthroughs because these while being pretty much the pulse point of the global population as we stand today uh, it 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 touches upon our education it touches upon our health it touches upon our nutrition it touches upon our very survival right uh, ai is the next big thing so uh, or maybe the current big thing if covid-19 had not happened uh, so what we see here is the more human ingenuity and creativity actually comes closer to truly revolutionizing and augmenting and enhancing and 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 really blessing you know uh, the the everyday trials tribulations uh, struggles of humanity unfortunately the more becomes the monetary uh, well hyperbole that comes into place because of the extent of investment that goes in and that has over the years become more and more of a, a troubling a troubling what had been a side issue is now becoming more and more of a central and a main issue which is a little uh, sad uh, now you would wonder why is it something where uh, why why is the patent domain being affected so strongly as i just just mentioned if you go to the next slide slide number 12 um i've tried to make it a little clearer so what are the what are the characteristics which uh, go into the determining of whether a particular product is uh, is deserving of a patent monopoly or not novelty inventive step industrial application um and ordre public or morality now what do we mean by novelty if we go to slide number 13 so the pictures i think speak for themselves first of all we are looking at this 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 timeless uh, fascination of man with flying right from the time of uh, of leonardo da vinci we have seen diagrams of flying machines with the legends of 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 india of greece of china of any old civilization in the world has some mention of creatures flying about so this is something which has captured human imagination since ages and then as you see the progression of the flying machines and finally we finish with um, a state of the uh, state of the art uh, boeing aircraft so the fact that this is an idea which was novel in and of itself and that novelty factor has not worn off so that is a very very everyday pedestrian understanding of how novelty works that it's it's new it's it's really nothing like it before 
The next uh, slide is slightly more nuanced, wherein we talk about the inventive step. When something comes out for the first time, it is new indeed. But then there are add-ons to that. There are further enhancements to that. So it no longer stays utterly novel anymore, right? So when Alexander Graham Bell picked up the phone and said, hello, so that was uh, a novel thing. But that telephone contraption, right down to the, the iPhone picture that I have provided with, uh, you with, uh, it's, it's a long journey. The concept remains the same. Telecommunication is nothing novel, but now we are having a conversation where all of us from all over the country, country and maybe some from other countries are listening to one conversation, are participating in one conversation simultaneously in real time. So if you do not call that strides in telecommunication technology, what else can you call it? So that, again, is proof of the fact that not only novelty, but an inventive step building on a pre-existing product can also, if it does bear that mark of genius, can also indeed revolutionize the lives and the realities of people. So that is your next step, the inventive step. The next slide, slide number uh, 15 talks about industrial application. And again, a simple example is locomotion, right? You walk, you get the wheel, you have the, what in India we call the tela, and then you have more and more wheels and contraptions and, and, and levers and, and mechanics added onto it. And then you see the evolution of the classic automobile. So we start out with uh, Gottlieb, Gottlieb Daimler. He came up with his first, uh, you know, uh, automobile. Which, which would which was hydro powered and it had uh, it, you had to you had to keep uh, pedaling it and it, it had you know it, it worked on, on very different uh, principles but essentially it was a, a locomotory tool and we finished we, we finished with um, a maserati speaks for itself right uh, so again we are working in sync with what the marketplace needs an eye at the consumer, an eye at what is society thirsting for, what is the need of the hour, how can we push it, how can we serve that need, and then go two steps higher, so that what was merely a utility and necessity now becomes something aspiration. You wouldn't definitely look at an ambassador and a Maserati the same way, right? But they essentially perform the same function. That is... Uh, the, the point of psychology that, that we were talking of, talking of here. Now, uh, moving to the next slide, slide number 16, order, public, and morality. That was the last uh, cat categorization. So the reason why we're going through this is for us to understand as to why the patent domain is particularly so rife with uh, you know, claims and counterclaims and such great animosity and, and uh, the, the pro-patent um, patent right holders and the anti-patent right holders uh, all, all fighting such passionate battles. What exactly is at stake? So, so far you have been seeing what is at stake from the point of view of the people who are desirous of being awarded with a patent protection and a time-bound monopoly. Now we come to order public morality, which is something where both sides have something to say. Uh, for instance, um, as you can see, um, how can you patent something which is or is derived of directly uh, something that is pre-existing in nature. Some people would say, well, if I have shown significant inventive step, then why not? If I have cloned a mouse, if I have if I've cloned a mouse or if I've cloned a bacterium with a with a specific uh, you know trait, I'm I'm for those of you who know, I'm talking about uh, diamond versus chakravarti. So that was the oil eating bacterium. And the industrial application was that it would be able to eat through oil in the aftermath of the great oil spill. Um, and then I'm talking about the Harvard Oncomouse. So these have been like uh, breakthrough cases where both sides have hotly contested and come up with a new understanding of where one needs to draw the line, even if it's a line in the sand, even if it's something which is perhaps transient and maybe the next generation will push it back even further. But you still need to draw a line somewhere in order to understand how far, it's, it's almost like how close can you fly to the sun, right? Without, 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 getting burnt yourself. So how far can we push? How far can we push the remits of human ingenuity and in, in the cause of enhancement, in the cause of progress? And where does it become something which 
interferes with nature, which becomes more self-destructive than beneficial, which is something which starts raising questions about the core inherent public morality of the exercise. So this is uh, a, a rather contentious uh, aspect, uh, which, which also definitely needs to be looked at when somebody is being granted or a patent application is being filed. Um, moving to the next slide, slide 17, uh, it, we continue from the previous uh, slide, where is continuing debates. So um, there are two sides to every story, and intellectual profitification is no exception. So on the one hand, there will be people who will enjoy monopoly, who will enjoy uh, the just, or in some cases, slightly excessive uh, fruits of their labor, of, their, of the, the, the efforts that they have put in. And then on the other side, there are people who either do not ascribe to that or have been left behind in, the, in this massive march, onward march of uh, societies uh, towards mercantilist progress. Or there are others who simply cannot afford to be part to this conversation because they lack the resources. And the monopolization keeps pushing the threshold higher and higher to such a level that uh, they, they just automatically get disenfranchised in this entire conversation. It's as though uh, poverty or relative poverty is an indicator of how valuable your life is. So you could be a citizen of, of the very same country and where people are um, well, going ahead and availing of um, universally breakthrough, cutting-edge uh, medical surgeries, you could you could be you could be a, a national or a citizen of that very country and be lacking for uh, maybe a polio vaccine or maybe a, a basic uh, drug um, that could that could uh, save you from you know uh, dying out of. of uh, uh, well, dehydration, or maybe uh, some kind of a diet supplement which could be, make the difference between a healthy child and a malnourished child. So all of these things, at the same given point in time, are simultaneously playing out in individual countries. And I'm not talking only about India. India is one, but there are many, many, many other countries, most other countries, in fact, where uh, there are such multiple strands of reality that are playing out. And fortunately or unfortunately, intellectual property discussions, intellectual propertyfication, uh, intellectual property regimes, intellectual property laws, um, the, the qualitative standards <clears throat> and the legal qualifiers which are placed uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in, order to, in order to give um, shape, in order, to, uh, in order to, so the, basically the constants, we were talking about variables and constants. So the constants which have been brought about by the establishment and by the powers that be in order to give shape and uh, a contour to what intellectual property uh, fication uh, ought to be and what uh, service is it, it, it prefers to society, uh, oftentimes is something that needs to, that needs, actually needs to come up for reviewing for introspection, for thinking as to whether are we still on the right track? Is our heart still in the right place? Are we moving in the right direction? Uh, which will take us to our next slide, um, wherein we are talking about uh, patent eligible subject matters exclusion. So we have laws of nature, we have national products, we have abstract ideas, which are then commodified into tangible products. And then uh, the one is a cartoon, of course, as you can see, genetically modified organisms, uh, boarding. Uh, the proverbial Noah's Ark, and then we are looking at uh, gene therapy, gene splicing, uh, CRISPR, as <clears throat> mo many more of us are now familiar, thanks to uh, the latest uh, no Nobel Award, um, and, and, and the absolute unquestionable scientific breakthroughs that are being made, uh, pushing the frontiers of knowledge, pushing the frontiers of, of, of human uh, you know, ingenuity yeah, and human industry and, and the desire to learn more, to, to, to push harder, to do better, uh, to ameliorate um, uh, ailments and sickness and suffering uh, from society, which, uh, whether we believe it or not, is where the core of all of these um, exercises and, and uh, well, initiatives had sprung up from. But the question of the hour, and again, this is something I believe uh, we will come back to when we are wrapping up our discussion 
and looking at uh, instances where the law seems to fall short or the law doesn't really seem to serve um, the more vulnerable or the law doesn't really seem to be, be playing out in a more even-handed manner as we would expect from any law. That is where we need to take a step back and we need to sort of introspect and think to ourselves that now that we know not just the what of intellectual property education, but the whys thereof, is this what we had started out for? Are we indeed moving in the right direction? And whatever it is that is in store for us, is it in consonance, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, slide number 19, uh, is it in consonance with uh, whatever it is that had started off this, this glorious, glorious journey so many centuries ago? So in conclusion, um, the questions that we should be asking ourselves and having further discussions and debates about are, how protective should protection be? the importance of mass awareness, the need for greater dialogue, like the ones that we are having, and inclusive decision-making and framing balanced laws. So a law is no good if it doesn't serve the people for whom it's designed. And by people, we don't mean a class of people or a group of people, but everyone. That's a very tall order, yes, but nobody said lawmaking was a walk in the park, right? Um, so these are the... Uh, final thoughts that I would like to leave you with. And I do hope that uh, this very, very brief and cursory um, discussion that we have just had has given you some, some sort of a perspective. That was the idea. The brief was not to go too deep into anything, but to give you a background idea as to why do things work the way they do? Why do certain laws appear the way they do? And why do certain uh, market dynamics play out the way that they do today. What is their backstory? Where did they come from? What is the psychology behind this? And now that we know all of that, uh, where exactly are we headed? Thank you so much. Hello, am I audible? Hello? Yes. Am I audible now? Yes, you're audible. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I'm Shumanika Ganguly, Faculty, Department of Economics, Kikadash College. Thank you very much for taking us through this wonderful journey of IPRs. Uh, due to lack of time, uh, I would just uh, like you to take a couple of questions which have come, and rest can be dealt with later on via email, uh, which uh, we'll again send it to our participants. So uh, I'll straight away head towards the first question. Uh, this has been done by Mr. Ronjan Audrey. Uh, he's uh, asking, uh, do you mean to say that branding did not exist in Barker system? This comes straight from your presentation today, I guess. So ma'am, your take on it. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, I would not say branding did not exist in the Barter system. I would say quote-unquote branding did not exist in the barter system. What I mean is, you, it was definitely free for, for everybody. I mean, if you wish to brand your goods, why not? Nobody stopped you. But it was not a bona fide distinguisher and a game changer that it became in the latter ages when it became more and more mainstream and institutionalized. That is what I had meant. I hope it's clear now. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question. In which field of human creativity IPR is not applicable? This question has been put forward by Ms. Sangeeta Hajra uh, from Shobharani Memorial College, West Bengal. Yes, uh, this, this is a very interesting question. In which field of I, uh, human creativity is IPR not applicable? Now, you know, the answer to that is everything and nothing. So it is at the end of the day, it is an element of choice, right? You as an author may choose to go to a publisher and get your book published under a certain brand and um, you know the rest of the rigmarole follows. You as a pharmacologist might choose to tie up with a pharmaceutical company and, pr and produce a molecule for them and then they will market it and it gets branded and the, the, the patenting uh, juggernaut comes into force. Right. So whether or not you make something applicable is entirely up to you 
and uh, the, the entire momentum that goes with it. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm very tempted to say that, uh, you know, not-for-profit uh, exercises, whichever domain of creativity or art or philosophy that it may cover, is something where you may not wish to bring in um, any element of profitification. But again, the bottom line is, it is it can be as pervasive or as um, you know as pervasive and as potent and as powerful and as insignificant as you the author or the creator or the producer would want it to be and that is the beauty uh, of this tool it is at the end of the day a tool which is which brings me back again just a minute brings me back again to the the last part of my talk wherein i said that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that these are all tools which have been designed for the betterment of our collective existence. And they should not become the masters that rule our lives instead. That is the sum and substance of what I'm trying to convey. So a very good question. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, last question. Uh, this has been put forward by Ms. Abha Simha, librarian, Jain B. Rajgir Bihar. How much is IPA justified in India? Um, justified meaning, um, uh, is, is, uh, is the lady in question, is she here in the, in the audience? If she, if there, if she is, then if she could just, um, explain what she means by justified. If she's talking about whether or not a country like India, where, uh, the poverty levels and the accessibility levels are very different from developed, developed nations, uh, whether or not, it, yeah, whether or not it at all makes sense. Uh, to have any kind of IPR, then that that I, I can understand if that is what she's asking. Yeah, especially oh. maybe in, uh, in cases of medicines or some essential items. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Want to address here? Address that? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I, I get it. Uh, so again, it's it's a very relevant and a very timely question. So um, uh, what I would say to that is, given I mean, one can't turn back the clock, right? Um, one, one can wish that certain things in the past uh, did not happen, but the fact of the matter is those things have happened. And as not just as Indians, but as an entire global population, we are but uh, the functions of our collective history. That is what we are. We are the products of our history. What we can do is try to be a little better than that and not be held ransom by our history. Um, at the same time, I completely understand and empathize with uh, what, what this question seeks to address. However, at this particular point in time, and again, while it is very easy for us, let's say academics or maybe NGOs or, or pressure, pressure group workers or uh, think tank workers, we, our job is to focus on a certain point and to agitate and to create awareness and to push for that particular point. But one needs to be appreciative of, a fact, of the fact that for any kind of sovereign authority, that could be a government, that could be a kingship, that could be anything, any kind of a sovereign authority, the task is a lot less enviable, you see, because they don't have the luxury of only looking at one side of a particular problem and solving it and then moving on to the next. Running a state requires looking at every facet of a situation, whether it be a problem, whether it be a good thing, and then taking a call based on that. So it's always like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So at this day and age, it would be a bit of an overstatement to say that there is no justification to have uh, this kind of a, you know, uh, capitalistic approach towards knowledge and knowledge-based products that should be free for all. It's, it's all uh, absolutely philosophically and idealistically uh, very, very sound, very appreciable. But realistically, where we are today, the fact of the matter is the state needs the money. The nation needs the money. So there is no running away from the fact that intellectual propertification is here to stay. What needs to be debated, what needs to be discussed, or what needs to be understood is doing something and not doing something are two ends of a spectrum. What, what is key right now is not to decide which end of the spectrum we want to go to because extremes are never good, is to understand how to calibrate ourselves so that we fall somewhere comfortably within that spectrum 
wherein we do have intellectual propertyification so that we are not completely out of sync with all other countries and we're not speaking a different language but at the same time it is done in a manner which does not diminish us but is made to work to our optimal advantage that is the challenge that is the trick which of course as we all know we are we are working towards but we are yet to crack okay uh, thank you so much ma'am uh, thank you with this with this we come to an end of this uh, question and answer session uh, of the first part of our webinar today uh, i thank parunita ma'am for this extremely informative and illuminating session uh, now for the next session over to my colleague mr deepo mojumdar faculty of economic faculty department of economics state bash college thank you thank you shumanika ji i think uh, i am both visible and audible uh, first of all i would like to thank and convey my warm regards to professor das gupta uh, for her insightful and enlightening lecture uh, thank you ma'am thank you for such an engaging session i i thank you on behalf of my college my colleagues and hope to listen from you in future again uh thank however, you much well kind of you however without wasting uh, no time i would uh, i would like to proceed to the next session uh, and would like to introduce our next speaker dr onir ban mojumdar uh, dr mojumdar graduated from calcutta university and done his llb from barwan university he went on to do his llm from national law school of india bangalore and mphil from national university of judicial sciences calcutta he has been awarded phd by national university of judicial sciences calcutta he specializes in intellectual property law and information technology law and offers these subjects both in undergraduate and postgraduate levels Dr Mojumdar a fellow of Max Planck Institute for Intellectual Property Munich has been a visiting scholar at the Turo Law School New York University and Cardiff University He has also been a Siegler scholar at the Tel Aviv University Israel He is a visiting professor of West Bengal University of Technology Institute of pharmaceutical research and healthcare management institute of engineering and management calcutta business school and international management institute he also contributed to various national and international journals with his research uh, with his research interest that includes intellectual property laws copyright law patent law and information technology law uh, i think i have covered uh, dr mojumdar's uh, introduction rightly if if uh, anywhere anything is wrong in my uh, address then please pardon me uh, today he will be speaking on copyright in teaching and research and the question answer session after his talk will be conducted by our colleague mr shayan kumar gupta uh, i would now like to request dr mojumdar to deliver his lecture and over to you sir good evening everyone i hope you can hear me yes uh, sir. yes perfectly uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to you and um, professor mojumdar thank you for all those kind words uh, it's always a challenge after uh, if i have to speak after paramita so um, you know i'll i'll speak on a very mundane issues on copyright law um, but the foundation which she has created uh, it will be very easy for me to now build on that so uh, let me just present the slides
Can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, you can continue. Okay. Uh, you you have already heard from uh, Paramita that you know the if you look at the entire intellectual property family then copyright is one of the important member of that family and uh, to understand that why we need copyright law we can always refer to the first copyright act in the world which is statute of Anne in 1710 and the very first sentence of that uh, statute uh, says it is an act for the encouragement of learning so you know you can understand that in 1710 people realized that how important it is to encourage learning system and how copyright law can be a very useful instrument in you know in achieving that goal so even today it is as useful and as relevant as it was in 1710 so today also if you want to evaluate copyright act and its function then you have to ask this question that is it encouraging our learning system or not if it is not then we have definitely deviated from the objective and there is no use of copyright law if it is not uh, encouraging learning system okay but what has happened is that uh, there is a, a shift in our approach to education now if you if you refer to the uh, educational experience in Nalanda and Takshila, then uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a learning system which was based on free imparting of education. This free imparting of education which was there in uh, Nalanda and Takshila, uh, I believe today education has become a major uh, business, uh, you know, project. So that is a shift which has taken place and which is a fact which you need to accept. So today, education is more uh, a, a business project, it's a business model. And, uh, and obviously there are consequences of that. Apart from the fact uh, that education has taken uh, you know, uh, a business-centric approach, uh, if you look at this industry like publishing industry, database industry, software industry, all these industries, they are continuously influencing our law and policy. And these industries are mainly to, uh, to do business, to make profit. And uh, naturally, their objective is more uh, in, in increasing its incentive. Okay. Uh, rather than uh, how uh, easily product will be accessible. So we need to keep that also in mind that these industries have come up and these industries demand is getting reflected in uh, today's legislation. If you refer to uh, an international instrument like uh, trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, TRIPS, their IP has been described as private property. Mm, again, uh, again, an ind indication that uh, a private property will have its understanding that uh, to maximize the commercial exploitation, to maximize the profit with very less, uh, you know, um, approach or attention to uh, public interest. And when you look at a national IPR policy, also uh, talk about robust IPR system. A robust IPR system is definitely when you recognize IPR, when you enforce IPR, when you uh, create an environment for business relating to IPR. If we move on, when you look at the academic approach, in academic approach, there are three points which uh, you know, we like, like to mention. One is that Indian traditional approach that knowledge has to be disseminated as non-commercial activity that has a role to play and then the income generated from copyright was not that much of significance so people were less careful or rather given less attention to this side of the law 
and then educational institutions also did not realize that uh, you know ip can actually create wealth and you know it is it, you can use it as a wealth generating and activity so these are the three things which has created a peculiar academic approach which is very specific to indian uh, uh, indian situation today whereas if you try to see that how we are moving forward we are trying to take copyrightable work as commodity and we are trying to uh, do business based on these commodities we are trying to commercially exploit these commodities commodities and we are trying to exploit all possible technologies which are around which can facilitate this business process if you look at the uh, the technology which has come up for the storage of information and for dissemination of information that has also influenced this approach so even the the fact that today uh, we are uh, you know we are uh, using a technology we are from different parts of the country uh, coming to a place for two hours and you know exchanging our view is a product of technology and it has changed the very approach so uh, gone are the days when uh, you know you are dependent on one uh, document which is somewhere in the country and everybody has to go there to access uh, today you can access any document anywhere it is placed because of the uh, in, you know technology like internet now if you look at that the business in its uh, you know education in in its business avatar then uh, yes that has increased lot of opportunities that has created uh, many uh, you know uh, advantages but is it has its own you know uh, uh, negative impact so that that also we have to keep in mind so what is important is that at this point of time when we are in this shifting situation uh, we need to give a fresh look and we need to ask ourselves that what are we uh, you know what do we want actually okay and uh, here i will give you an example like as all most of uh, you know us we are in academics now you know when you you, you know you, all of you will are uh, you published article in different journal now when you uh, in, in your paper get uh, accepted uh, you need to ask yourself how much money did you earn to that now if it ends up with publication yes that gives you a certain a sort of satisfaction that your uh, your writing your work your paper has been accepted for publication but but uh, somewhere that it is a property which could have been commercially exploited and you did not receive anything as honorarium uh, is is an issue which we need to uh, keep in mind and we need to work on that i'm not suggesting that uh, we have to uh, you know go after money always but it's also very important to keep in mind that you really worked hard you wrote an article or you uh, wrote a paper it got published and then at the end of the day uh, you did not receive any royalty or uh, so that that is something which you need to keep in mind if we look at this case called uh, cch canada now what happened is that in this uh, you know this is a um, uh, uh, case related to a uh, law society of upper canada who had uh, a library which was used by uh, students pay mem members of judiciary lawyers judges researchers and this library it had a photocopying machine inside the library which is generally which is there you know which is not a very a unique thing you know it, it happens in all library but this library they were uh, offering a, a sort of a special service that all these members if they are uh, in need of any document then they can approach the library and library will make photocopy and pass it on to them so this was the added service which was 
uh, offered by this uh, up, you know, library of upper uh, society, law society of upper Canada. Now, uh, a publishers a group called CCH Canada, they felt that this is an infringement and they filed the case. Now, understand that a library which generally which is meant for usage and members are supposed to use, they generally come, they go through different material, then they select which one to photocopy, then they photocopy and go. So that's an usual practice, but here you don't have to come. Rather, you, you if you need a document, you just inform the library, they will make photocopy and pass it on to you. Now for this additional service, the publishers group, they are uh, filing a case against the uh, the library for infringement. So, oh, what you know? Wh you know. So, why why is it? What what's the problem? Now here, uh, Supreme Court of Canada observed certain things which are very important and which you can keep in mind. This is that look uh, uh, the fair dealing exception. You know, as as you know that in copyright, uh, we have fair use of fair dealing exception which to, is to increase accessibility, which is to balance the, the interest of the public or the users with the, the right owner who enjoy monopoly. Uh, and they observed that fair dealing exceptions were categorized as user right and must be balanced against the rights of the copyright owner. So we understand that copyright owner have certain rights because of the copyright law. So these publishers, as because they own this copyright, so they do have certain rights. There is no problem, but it has to be balanced with the rights of the user. You cannot just maximize the incentive and make everything uh, positive for the right owner and keeping nothing for the user. That should not happen. In interpreting research, the court stated that it must be given a large and liberal interpretation in order to ensure user's right are not unduly constrained. So when you talk about research, research not necessarily by coming down to the library physically and obtaining document and getting research, you know, getting photocopied by yourself. Research has to be given a very liberal interpretation, broad interpretation. Then only that will serve the purpose. Otherwise, you know, it will get constrained and research will not ultimately fulfill its objective. And uh, uh, Supreme Court observed that we need to uh, take a look at few factors. And those are like, what was the purpose for which it was done? So those photocopying which are done, they for what purpose they have been done? What was the character of the work that you look at that? Is it is it, you know, that uh, is it a commercial or non-commercial or research related what what sort of uh, you know character it has how much they have photocopied have have they photocopied the entire library have they photocopied the entire book or have they photocopied few chapters few pages here and there is there any alternative which is equally available and what which was not uh, you know exploited and then nature of the work that what sort of work is it a, a compilation is it a textbook is it uh, you know, a, a journal, what sort of uh, work it is, and then the effect of such exception or such usage that what happened just because few people photocopied or few members photocopied, what happened? Uh, your entire lost stock, in entire sales stopped, or what, what was the consequence? So, these things we need to keep in mind. Now, if you look at and understand the basics of copyright. The basics of copyright is, is definitely to create economic right to the author. And uh, the purpose is very simple that, you know, it is the author who have invested his intellectual labor and created this property. So he has to be given certain economic right which he can exploit and he can get certain benefit out of that. And the copyright is to ensure maximum commercial exploitation of the author's work. And by maximizing that commercial exploitation, you will earn economic incentive. That's the purpose. Copyright has to prevent unauthorized exploitation. And you know, as you are, you want to 
maximize commercial exploitation so you have to keep in mind that unauthorized exploitation should be limited and then we need to have a moral right which will acknowledge that if you are using author's work you acknowledge author's work and don't distort and mutilate work while using it so they, these are certain basics of copyright which you need to remember if you are looking at the philosophy which is working behind copyright then it is important that we must understand that author uses existing knowledge base to create new work so nothing is created out of vacuum actually so if today author is trying to exercise his monopoly author also has to understand that author should be grateful and should acknowledge the fact that he has used all existing material to create his work so when i have written a book i have definitely exploited all possible existing knowledge and i must be grateful to all those authors who wrote that otherwise i would not have been in a position to write so you you must understand that uh, you have used and exploited lot of work to create your work so your work also should get into public domain at some point of time in another case called university london versus university tutorial uh, you know the judges has observed uh, a sentence which is uh, work which is worth copying is prima facie worth protecting that is you know if you see if you if you know that uh, a, a new film is about to be released the day before release a lot of pirated material pirated versions will be available in the internet so if you are trying to protect that you have to give protection at that point of time because you know it is it is at that point of time when people are everyone is trying to copy and you have to give protection at that point of time now that does not mean that when uh, there is a film which no one wants to copy uh, you will not protect it so it is true that you have to look at the vulnerability and uh, by examining the vulnerability you have to make sure that you give enough protection or you give protection which is proportionate to the vulnerability but it is equally true that if no one is trying to copy a work that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any protection it has equal protection then uh, we need to understand that in uh, one of the case in india on eastern book company supreme court said that if it, if you create a derivative work then that has to have a that has to satisfy a higher threshold that means uh, you know when you write when you know in this context uh, there was a uh, you know a reporting of judgment so when you wrote a judgment that's a a uh, regular work regular literary work and then when you are creating a derivative literary work this derivative work has to satisfy a higher threshold of originality that is you no know, if it is a work of first instance it is you know the level of originality can be very low but if it uh, if it is a derivative work then we we have to have a, a higher threshold of originality Uh, because we all understand that originality is one of the requirement in case of copyright law so until unless your work is original you cannot have copyright but when you are creating the work of first instance then suppose you are writing an article no matter what quality of article it is no matter how authentic it is no matter uh, you know how, how how good research it is but you know as because you have written it you, you have copyright in that but tomorrow if i want to uh, come up with a compilation of many articles written by all of you then that's a derivative work in that case if i want to have a copyright in that then i have to have a higher threshold of originality i just can't uh, go with the regular standard of originality it is important to refer to article 27 of universal declaration of human right because universal declaration of human right also has referred to moral and material interest resulting from a uh, scientific literary and artistic production of which is a author that means if an author has created a property then uh, by using his intellectual labor then that that you know that he has the right to protect the material and moral interest so uh, that is also recognized by a universal declaration of human right 
this is one of the uh, article where you know the the author has uh, made an appeal and and has given an argument that all the academic work according to him all the academic work uh, should not be under copyright uh, his argument is that all the academic work which we are producing every day uh, you know our our incentive is publication and when other people they recognize that you have published a good article that is good enough incentive for us and uh, we we don't have to exercise copyright on that so it, it is one of the uh, you know obviously legally speaking that is not the situation today uh, you know academic works are very much within part of copyright law as any other work but his argument is that uh, it will serve better if uh, at least at the academic work we keep it it outside the purview of copyright protection if you look at all the academic content now academic content to refer to few will be question paper which you prepare phd thesis which you write uh, dissertations which you write uh, the compilations which you make the textbook which you write guide books which you write your lecture notes your articles your comments your book review your study material your question banks the computer program computer databases so all of them as a whole they will uh, constitute uh, academic uh content i ha i have only taken literary work there can be uh, you know equal volume of artistic work as well as uh, you know cinematograph film for the purpose of say engineering work or for any matter like nowadays lot of uh, you know lectures you will get in in audio visual medium so all of them are part of academic content and for all these academic content we need to understand that Uh, they will enjoy copyright provided they are original and when we say that they are original uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, their expressions are protected their idea are not protected and that's very important in copyright law you cannot protect an idea you have to protect an expression you know that's why you will find uh, 20 history book on in the library uh, obviously they are not uh, creating new history every time they are writing the same history but their way of writing their research their way of presentation their way of communication are different and that's why one history book uh, will have more market uh, response another history book might not have but each one of them are uh, independently copyrightable and hmm? uh, they must uh, you know they must originate from the author in the sense that you need you don't copy copy from others you know you, it must originate from the author so that's why it is original uh, not that you have to create a new thing which uh, paramita was referring that in case of patent you have to come up with a new invention that is novelty but in copyright law you don't have to come up with any new stuff no you you just give a new expression uh, it can be something which is there for ages but even then so long you give a new expression it will become copyrightable and once it becomes copyrightable there are certain rights which are which you as owner of copyright you will enjoy and those rights are right to reproduce right to distribute right to translate right to make adaptation right to make performance and right to communication to public so there are several exclusive right and each one of these exclusive rights you can exploit and the duration of protection is life of the author plus 60 years so uh, 60 years from the death of the author is the uh, duration and that's why uh so long you you and only you who can exploit this uh, either by yourself or through by licensing through someone else but it is your monopoly so that is the way you earn incentive when you talk about uh, ownership yes generally it is the author who is the first owner because we believe that author they create the property by themselves but sometime the author may be under an in the course of employment and if they are in the course of employment then generally uh, if those conditions are satisfied that it is a contract of service and there is no contract to the contrary in that case it is the employer who will be the owner of copyright so when i write something for the university although i am the author of it but as because i wrote it in the course of employment my employer that is the university will become the owner of copyright 
and the course of employment will depend on what sort of work was assigned when did i do it how it is related to my terms of employment so all the question paper which we set uh, you know uh, all the uh, reading material which we make they are all uh, you know they are all um, uh, coming under course of employment that's why we all are author for them but copyright belongs to the university we need to understand fair use because in case of uh, you know uh, research in case of academic usage fair use is very important and uh, you know as as you you can understand that fair use is an exception to infringement so they will not constitute infringement uh, statutorily they have been recognized and, uh, and and few few grounds are like if it is for private use if it is for a personal use if it is for research or criticism or review then it comes within the fair use uh, in in there are you know uh, a country where uh, both in india as well as uh, outside uh, when we determine fair use we use certain criteria as i said earlier the purpose of use we look at we look at the nature of the work we look at how much of it has been used that is substantiality and we look at the impact on the market so uh, when when we look at this uh, fair, you know uh, fair dealing uh, obviously there are certain you know in certain cases we look at fair use in certain cases we look at fair dealing uh, you know the fact you know the if in a jurisdiction where uh, those uh, you know there are certain situation which are statutorily given uh, so they are not constituting infringement they are exception okay so in india you will find uh, section 52 has lot of uh, you know situation which are given in the legislation that they will not constitute infringement so you don't have to look at the factors there but in certain cases you do not have those uh, listed uh, you know item rather you every time you look at those four factors and determine whether there is infringement or not uh, the delhi university photocopy case is very important in indian context and court was very clear that uh, you know that statutorily we do not have quantitative restriction quantitative restriction in the sense that see we we are allowed to photocopy for the purpose of research uh, we are allowed to photocopy for academic usage uh, there is no question that how many pages you can photocopy so it, it all depends on my requirement it all depends on my uh, nature of research so if i need to photocopy the entire page i can make photocopy of entire page if i need to photocopy you know 10 pages i can do that so there is no quantitative restriction uh, although they, it was argued in this case but uh, court finally said that no there is no quantitative restriction in the law and that's why it will not be imposed And when you talk about uh, fair use, one of the clause which is important is this, that reproduction of uh, work by a teacher or a student in the course of instruction. So when I reproduce, like when I photocopy as a teacher or as a student in the course of instruction, there is no question of infringement. And in the course of instruction, it is not necessarily the, uh, you know, class timing. It is, it goes beyond as well as, you know, after. So when I prepare the syllabus, I, uh, you know, the, it is within course of instruction. When I prepare the study material, it is within the course of instruction. When I prepare for my class, it is course of instruction. When I teach actually in the class, that is also course of instruction. When I evaluate, that is also for course of instruction. Again, for the student, when they prepare for the class, when they prepare for the exam, when they write their research paper, everything is within the course of instruction. Storing of work by electronic means by a non-commercial public library for preservation. This is allowed, but if the library possesses non-digital copy, so archiving you can do provided you have a hard copy in your uh, library. And then uh, you can make three photocopies of the book, provided the book is not available in India for sale. So, eh, so it's not that you know you can just a photocopy and keep it there in the library it's not that you can make three copies of a book only when uh, the book is not available in the market uh, for sale adaptation of any work accessible in the format to facilitate disabled uh, persons with disability again 
people who are uh, you know having disability maybe visual disability or so so any adaptation which is necessary to make it accessible to them will not be an infringement so this is also to increase accessibility of people who are suffering from certain disability uh, this uh, case i have referred because you know uh, unfortunately sometimes this happens is that uh, the teachers they exploit students work uh, and this case was also like that uh, it is the guide who exploited the, the scholar's work and court uh, observed a teacher cannot be allowed to copy the work of his student and obtain a degree of phd and earn future promotion on that basis so you may be guide you your job is to guide the student but that does not mean that you become uh, the uh, the author of the work it is after all the scholar's work and it is for the scholar to exploit you are not supposed to exploit that and if you do that and if you try to earn any degree whether phd or any other degree and based on that you will get promotion that's very unfair you you write you create your work and you get your degree and you earn all promotion there is no problem but you, you are not supposed to exploit your scholar's work um, but sometime unfortunately that happens uh, to conclude uh, every educational institution they should have copyright policy this is something important because you know we we uh, there is something which is missing in in our environment that uh, there is very lack of awareness in the entire academic environment uh, you, you, st you you look at from the schools uh, you know standard 2 standard 3 standard 4 from that time onwards uh, they start uh, taking material from internet take a print out and submit so they get a training that you can actually copy and paste and they get that training institutionally uh, from standard 2 standard 3 and so when they come to college and we tell them that look that is plagiarism that is not allowed and you are going to take action uh, they just can't match their reality and what is their expectation of the institute so from day one i think we need to give this awareness that you know yes internet is a huge resource for research there is no doubt you can find out everything from there but you learn from that okay you take inspiration from that but ultimately you have to do it by yourself you just can't copy and paste and if you keep on copying and paste uh, your work might be very easy uh, but uh, but ultimately you will land up in a situation where you have a very bad habit and you have to pay a heavy price for that so we need to have that awareness from the primary school uh, and then as you grow uh, you have you know we have to to uh, tell everyone that look all of us all of us we can uh, create work which is possible to be copyrighted which is possible to be commercially exploited you know you may you may be in in primary school but you can write a poem you can make a drawing and they are all copyrighted work and you have no idea what value it has you know you have absolutely no idea so many a time what happens is that we create property Uh, but we have no idea uh, the value of it and and naturally we lose opportunity to commercially exploit that we lose opportunity where we can get reward for that so this is something which we need to develop that at one side uh, do not copy paste do not create the culture of copy and paste at the same time whatever you create that might have a value you never know and that might be uh, possible that you can commercially exploit so we write a lot a lot of you know term paper or uh, you know the essays uh, as part of assignment uh, and it ends with the assignment whatever marks we get we are satisfied with that but uh, you never know it can be exploited further so uh, we hardly we take initiative to develop it as an article or uh, you know try to publish it in a journal or a newspaper and th because that 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 will incentivize us so that we have to develop that culture and that's why policy is very important policy must incentivize the employees researcher and the student so uh, that sort of incentivization is is necessary that it's not that i get my work published you know i am happy 
I put it in my CV. Apart from that, there can be many incentivization, uh, financial uh, incentivization, non-financial in incentivization. But there has to be some incentivization for the employees. They will also feel like doing something. Otherwise, it all becomes a routine thing that only for your promotion, do this much, earn this much a point and finish it off. Okay, the policy must be to uh, explore possibility of pot potential exploitation. So this potential exploitation, we we really don't try to explore. We you know we have to uh, to um, create an awareness that whatever you create, uh, let us examine its uh, possibility. Let us uh, explore its possibility for commercial exploitation. And we can take uh, technological protection nowadays. Uh, we must take that uh, technological protection, whatever is available. With that, we I conclude, and uh, uh, I believe there are questions. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for such an uh, enlightening lecture on uh, copyright in teaching and uh, research. Yes, we have a few questions. So with your permission, let me take the first one. So yeah. here, uh, Ms. Mohua Ghosh from Maya Landscape and Interior Private Limited. Now, she wants to know about the safeguarding of project photos and personal photos and videos. Over to you, sir. Mm -hmm uh personal photos and uh, project photos and personal photos and videos safeguarding okay. safeguarding them uh safeguarding is difficult you know wh what you can do is see uh, first let, let me tell you the background see in in our environment uh if i can successfully establish that i am the author then I can commercially exploit, I can earn all benefit till someone else exposes myself and say that, look, that is not your work. So, if you kindly mute, yeah, please mute, yeah. So, uh, so in our context, like, you know, if I give you an example, that suppose I uh, go to South Africa and get, uh, you know, a tune from the uh, um, tribes, and then I come here, I use that tune, and it becomes a commercial hit. Everyone will, explore, you know, appreciate. Every I'll get a lot of financial uh, uh, incentive till someone exposes that this is not original. This is actually taken from such and such tribe of such and such place. So, uh, you know, so, you, you know, the, the safeguarding is very difficult and especially because of the technology which we have. What you can do is that you should be careful and you should try to monitor that whether someone is protecting your work or, you know, someone is exploiting your work or not and whether those exploitations are unauthorized or not because that is what is important uh, see if you have taken project uh, you know photograph or if you have made certain video they you do have copyright in that at the most you can go for a registration although that is optional but you can go for registration but uh, you can't say that okay i have copyright so now i am immune i am completely protected uh, that's not that it all depends on whether others are willing to exploit your work or not and if they are, if others are willing to exploit your work no matter what precaution you take they will exploit so you need to go after them and uh, you need to take them to the court or you need to at least give them warning or you need to give them notice but that, that's, that's why I said that in copyright law, it's a situation is very, very different. That, you know, I, I, if, I, if I write an article where no one wants to copy, I'm very well protected because no one wants to copy. Now, if you make a film and everyone wants to copy. Now, why do they want to copy? Because they don't want to pay the real, you know, uh, the fees which is required if they want to see the original one. 
so they are they try to get a uh, pirated version but when people think that this is something which can be duplicated they will duplicate so if you have taken a photo and and suppose put it up in the internet then you might find the same photo have been copied and used in many places so if you do not go after them if you do not give them the notice that look that is my photo you cannot publish that and that's an infringement i'll take you to the court uh, they may listen to you they may not listen to you if they don't listen to you uh, you need to actually file a case and you know get an injunction against them so you have to take a lot of trouble to protect your work is that clear did i answer your question thank you sir thank you for your answer uh i'm taking the second uh, question mm -hmm. uh, the second question is from uh, dr hamid iqbal academia uh, west bengal he wants to know if an article accessed through an e journal then how the condition of copyright is applicable mm -hmm. now when you access it either from the hard copy or through e journal first of all you need to understand that the publisher have made it accessible to you and you have access you have access possibly because of the institutional arrangement or because of your personal arrangement now your access will be dependent on whether you can access forever or you can access only for one year or you can access only for 10 times that depends on the contractual arrangement through which that is the term, uh, terms of licensing but if it has been made accessible to you then you can have access to it otherwise you might not be able to access to it so uh, you know many a time you can you can uh, find that uh, uh, an an article is available you try to access then they will ask you uh, that you have to you know go through the account so what is your password what is your user id which will indicate that you have to take a license now it depends on you whether you will take license individually or you will take license from your institution and then you can get access and then it depends that whether the what is the nature of the access so that depends on the uh, terms of license thank you sir thank you very much sir eto job doyeche na sobho sarkara chhele bangla khabar chhalar khot theke chinta korte na amar sobho to pore bolte normally আমি যখন খাবো পয়সা দেখা আমি যা শুধু খাই বুঝাই কি তো এক কথা বলছি ডিপেন্ড টু দাস প্লিজ প্লিজ মিউট ইউরসেলফ সরি স্যার সরি ফর দি ইনকনভিনিয়েন্স इट्स ওকে স্যার স্যার উই হ্যাভ আ কোশ্চেন ইন আওয়ার চ্যাট বক্স বাই আদ্রিত পল uh yeah. now he is asking who can be the copyright holder of the lecture delivered by professor mojumdar you on behalf of kk dash college his question is uh, who is going to hold the copyright of your lecture uh, on behalf of kk dash college similarly who is the copyright holder of a thesis submitted to the university to earn the phd degree is the mm. university or the researcher mm. can hold the right of the content created okay uh copyright belongs to me in my lecture uh as because you invited me for the lecture if you take a permission or if you make a recording you can use this recording for educational purposes you can use this recording for teaching purposes there is no problem but if you want to commercially exploit you have to take permission from me because i do have copyright in it and in your uh, phd thesis it is the scholar who has copyright even if you submit it for a uh, degree university will only confer degree university does not own the property ownership of the property is with the scholar thank you sir thank you very much once again and uh, now i would uh, ask i would request uh, mr pritam kumar pal the convener of this webinar to deliver the vote of thanks and wrap up today's wonderful and informative webinar over to you mr paul am i audible sir yes yes thank you sir uh, honorable speakers respected principal sir my dear colleagues and all the participants uh, ladies and gentlemen 
A very good evening to all. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks for this occasion. On behalf of Kekedas College and the entire organizing team, I extend my hearty vote of thanks to the honorable speakers from the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, who blessed us with their presence and spending their valuable time with us. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Ms. Paramita Dasgupta for her wonderful lecture on a brief introduction of IPRs, history and development. We thoroughly enjoyed your lecture, madam. Let me express my gratitude to our other expert, Dr. Anirban Mojumdar. Sir, your thought provoking lecture on copyright in teaching and research really enriched us. The way you explain the topic is exemplary. We got Paramita, madam, as a speaker because of you, sir. Uh, I would like to extend my special thanks to our principal, sir, Dr. Ramchishna Prasad Chakraborty, for providing us thorough encouragement and support. I'm very grateful to Dr. Nasima Munsi, the IQSE coordinator of our college, for giving us an opportunity to organize this event. I extend my big thanks to all the departments associated with this event for their support. I offer my sincere thanks to other members of the organizing committee, Professor Rinku Saha, Head Department of Commerce, Professor Madhurima Kole, Head Department of Economics. I also wish to express my gratitude to Mr. Mohan Bir Subba, Mrs. Sumanika Ganguly, Mr. Sayan Kumar Gupta, and Mr. Deepro Mojumdar for managing the whole webinar efficiently. We remain grateful to Mr. Mridul Kanti Bhomik, Faculty of Computer Science, for the entire technical support. I'm very grateful to Team KKDC for their support to organize this webinar. I heartily congratulate all the participants for their active participation in this event. I hope you have enjoyed all the lectures and this will help you to make administrative decisions in your workplace. Please fill the feedback form to get your e-certificate. We look forward to your valuable input through feedback, which will help us to avoid our mistakes in future and improve the quality of our future events. Again, I thank you all all of you who have directly and indirectly contributed to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.